Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and today we're following up on yesterday's rapid review of the new Canon 7D Mark II, a camera that Chelsea and I both loved. We went over the focusing speed, how it did for wildlife, sports, portraits, indoor sports and outdoor sports, and also we talked about image quality some. And it seems like the image quality part of it has been the most controversial part of it because during our live broadcast yesterday, DxO Mark made an announcement. And they said some things that seems to have contradicted what we said. We went over many sample images, compared them to other cameras, and said that it seemed like the 7D Mark II had not only improved, but it had actually surpassed some of the competitors. We're going to change that comment a little bit, make some adjustments, clarify some things, and look deep, deep into DxO Mark's rating system. So here's DxO Mark's exact quote. They say that with a DxO Mark sensor score of 70 points, the 7D Mark II ranks behind some older, smaller micro four thirds sensors, such as the EMD, EM1 and the GH4, or the DMC, they say, which is a little discouraging. So that's a really negative way to start a review of a brand new camera that we thought was absolutely stellar. Uh, we also use the GH4, and in fact, we've reviewed the EM1 II and I can say without a doubt that their image quality is not as good as the 7D Mark II. So I, I always believe that logical people, given the same set of facts, will come to the same conclusion. And I believe that DxO Mark and our team are all logical. Let's reconcile this. Here are DxO Mark scores for the 7D Mark II, the GH4, and the EM1. Now you can see this overall score, which seems like that's what you should be looking at is 70 for the Mark II, 74 for the GH4, and 73 for the EM1. So why is it so much worse for the 7D Mark II? It's got a bigger sensor. It's newer technology. Well, DxO Mark provides three separate, more granular ratings here. They provide the portrait color depth and the landscape dynamic range. And those are very interesting metri metrics. The portrait color range kind of tells you how many different graduations there are from like a perfect pure bright red to white. So the reason they call that portrait is it's particularly important for skin tones. Do you imagine if you took a picture of somebody you wouldn't want to see rough steps on their skin as say uh, the gradual lighting faded off on their forehead. You'd want it to be nice and smooth. So the portrait color depth is important as is the dynamic range. Dynamic range tells you how much you can recover the shadows or recover the highlights when your picture is too contrasty or not properly exposed. Dynamic range is one of the big reasons we switched from the 5D Mark III to the Nikon D810 anytime we could get the proper lens. Dynamic range is really important, especially for things like landscape photography, but really for all types of photography. It's really nice when you can recover those shadows. But this bottom line here, sports, what they call low light ISO, to me, it's by far the most important. First, I've never had anybody complain that pictures from any camera didn't have enough color depth. I just never hear that. Nobody ever says, I can see the difference between two different, slightly different shades of any particular color. I would argue that the color depth was important at some point in digital camera development, but, but today it seems like it's all good enough that it would not be perceptible to the eye. I'm interested in other feedback. Tell me if you think that's wrong. The dynamic range, like I said, it's important when you photograph a scene that's too contrasty or when you blow your exposure. But the ISO rating is important all the time. If you nail the exposure and the scene is perfectly lit, the ISO is going to determine just how much noise you have in the shadows and it gets particularly important in lower light situations or in times when you need a fast shutter speed, such as sports and wildlife. So it is really important for a camera that's designed for action. If we look at these ratings down here, we see in that bottom line, the 7D Mark II really beats the pants off of the GH4 and the EM1. In fact, it's 26% better than the GH4 and 30% better than the EM1, owing to its larger sensor. So go back to this quote, DxO Mark is saying that the 7D Mark II isn't doing as well as these two cameras, given the algorithm that they have for assessing the importance of ISO, dynamic range, and color depth. I would argue that that algorithm probably deserves to be tweaked. But in the meantime, they give you all the raw data, 
so you as a consumer can go look at it and decide what's most important to you. For me, by far the highest priority is ISO, and after that, dynamic range. The dynamic range, Canon's clearly <laughs> not that good at, and you notice it when you're trying to fix landscapes and such. Even in wildlife, it can be nice to recover the shadows in, say, the dark feathers of a dark bird, especially things like osprey, which are both white and black at the same time. So it's important, but that ISO number is important no matter what you're shooting, and the 70 Mark II actually does really well there. We'll dig even deeper into this. Here's another quote from a big online publication that really caused a lot of stir. You know why? Because people don't get into the data like this. They just read the headlines and then they move on. <laughs> and I got so many people tweeting me saying, oh, you're wrong about this because they read a headline. But let's read this headline. The 70 Mark II test score is identical to the five-year-old Nikon D300S. That seems really discouraging, right? Like Canon is just catching up to where Nikon was five years ago. But let's look at it in a little more detail. Here are DxO Mark scores. Again, we see the Canon is behind on the color depth and the dynamic range, but it's quite a bit ahead on the ISO scores. Here's the summary. It's 7% ahead of the Alpha 77, Sony's SLT camera that competes with it, and 37% ahead of that five-year-old Nikon camera. So if you're like me and you care about ISO, the amount of noise in the image more than those other things, then the 7D Mark II looks far superior. Like 37% is a whole lot. <laughs> and we'll get into just how much that is a little bit later. Um, and I also want to discuss the Alpha 77 a little bit later because some people are saying DxO Mark definitely said you might look at it as the all around camera. But before you do that, I would definitely assess the lenses that you want to get for it because. I love that 400 millimeter f5.6 lens on the Canon. Sony doesn't have anything like that. They have a zoom lens, but it costs more than twice as much. You can get that for about $1,200. About a th I got that one used for $1,000. It's wonderful. Canon, Nikon, Sony, I'm sorry, Nikon and Sony do not have anything comparable. So there are other factors besides just the sensor. Let's talk about how the 7D Mark II compares against the 7D looking at just image quality. This is something we talked about yesterday, but we'll go in a little deeper today. This is DxO Mark's assessment of it. You can see here that uh, the 7D Mark II is 26% better than the original 7D, and that's a huge number. In fact, 26% is the same difference between the Canon 5D Mark III and the Nikon D810. And the Nikon D810 is basically the best rated camera sensor in the world, and the 5D Mark III is basically the worst rated full frame sensor. So 26% is basically the difference between the best and the worst. <laughs> and that's the leap that Canon made from the original 7D to the 7D Mark II. It's a big, big difference. This is DxO Mark's ratings for the individual ISOs. Now we'll show another chart a little bit later that makes it look like at low ISOs, the 7D does not see any improvement. But you can see here, looking at the ISO ratings, the actual noise levels, that it's much, much improved across the board. Here's a sample image that we presented yesterday. I have to give a little bit of background. At this moment, Adobe has not released the algorithms to process images from the 7D Mark II. We always use Lightroom. And when we can't use Lightroom to process images, we use Adobe Camera Raw. Unfortunately, Adobe hasn't released updates for either. So we're stuck using the Canon digital imaging professional, digital photo professional <laughs> software, and it's terrible. The Canon raw processing software is awful. It's a real pain to work with. Uh, I processed these two images yesterday from the 7D and the 7D Mark II, pushed them to stop so we could see the shadow noise a little bit better using all the default settings from the software. Turns out that was a mistake because Canon kind of tweak the default settings a little bit. Here is a comparison of those two images again with noise reduction and unsharp mask completely eliminated. In other words, as close to the raw data as we can actually get. And you can see if you look at the image with the default settings, the 7D Mark II on the left seems to completely kill the 7D, right? You go to the settings with all those extra new defaults removed and they look much closer. But if you look closely, the 7D Mark II is significantly better. In fact, I would say it's about a third of a stop better, maybe 26% better, which is about what DxO Mark came up with. So here, we kind of agree 
once we scraped away the kind of Canon software processing to make it look better thing. Now let's determine, now let's compare the 7D Mark II at ISO 1600 and the 7D Mark II at ISO 3200. So what I've done is I've brought up the exposure on the 7D Mark II and another stop higher on the ISO. If the original 7D, if the 7D Mark II was a full stop better than the original 7D, then these two images, 1600 to 3200, would look about the same. But we can see that the 7D Mark II at ISO 1600 looks better than the 7D at ISO 1600. So there's an improvement. But the 7D at ISO 1600 still looks much better than the 7D Mark II at ISO 3200. And that tells us that there's not a full stop improvement in the new camera when you remove the extra processing. So let's talk about what a third of a stop really is. You get a full stop more light by switching from an f5.6 camera to an f4 lens, I should say lens, or you can get another stop by switching to an f2.8 lens. So you get about 26% here more light, but again, upgrading your lens could get you 100% more light, or if you went two stops, 400% more light. That's a, a big, big difference, far bigger than the difference that the improvements in the sensor might make. So instead of upgrading your body, you might just think about putting the many money into a faster lens if you can shoot wide open. This is a chart that some of the blogs kind of spread around showing that the sensor in the 7D Mark II wasn't improved at ISO 100 and 200. These first two dots over there are re roughly represent ISO 100 and 200, and the three, uh, 400 is the third dot there. And you can see they're basically identical. But this is the measurement of dynamic range, not the noise in the image. And as I said, the dynamic range is important, and that's an area that Canon is definitely behind in. But it's not ISO. In my mind, it's not as important because, again, you're really only going to notice the difference when you have to recover the shadows or the highlights. Let's talk about ISO scores and sensor efficiency. We're going to get real, real nerdy here. <laughs> so brace yourselves, geeks. I'm going to compare the ISO scores for the 5D Mark III, the D810, and the 7D Mark II. The 5D Mark III is about 24% behind the D810. If it were 100% behind, um, that would be about a full stop. So it's about a quarter of a stop. The 7D Mark II, if you compare it to the 5D Mark III, is 112% behind, owing mostly to the smaller sensor. If you've watched my crop factor videos, you already know that the biggest factor in image quality is the total amount of light gathered by the sensor. The 7D Mark II has a crop factor of 1.6, so it gathers significantly less light than the 5D Mark III. If you compare the 7D Mark II to the D810, it's 164% worse. So clearly, at ISO 800 or any given ISO, you're going to get significant, significantly cleaner images from a D810 than you would out of a 7D Mark II. The sensor's better, the sensor's bigger, etc. But let's talk about sensor efficiency. Sensor efficiency is how much image quality the camera is getting given the total amount of light that you've given it. This is a very academic discussion because sensor efficiency has no impact on what your images actually look like. What it does show you is how effective the camera manufacturer's technology is as they're creating sensors. So the 5D Mark III versus the D810, they have exactly the same sensor size and the 5D Mark III is 24% worse. If we go back a slide, you'll see the ISO score was exactly 24% worse. There's no need to factor in the crop factor here because the sensor size is the same. So the 5D Mark III sensor, just worse <laughs> than the D810. The D810 is newer, more advanced. If you compare the 7D Mark II to the 5D Mark III, the 7D Mark II is 20% better than the 5D Mark III. Now, how did I get to that number? I multiplied the 7D Mark II's ISO score times the crop factor squared. You square the crop factor because crop factor is a linear measurement. It's a one-dimensional measurement. ISO is a measurement that's based on a two-dimensional sensor. So you have to convert from linear math to two-dimensional math, and that requires squaring it. And this is an extremely effective way to kind of 
gauge where each camera manufacturer is in their sensor development technology. And so you can see Canon typically has been way behind Nikon and Sony. And if you've already read my photography buying guide, uh, I have a copy of it right here. You can check it out at sdp.io slash buybg. You already know the, a lot of this because I have a section on it, but Canon has been behind. And part of the reason I was so excited about the new 70 Mark II is that you can see here the sensor efficiency of the 70 Mark II is only 3% behind the D810. The D810 being basically the top rated sensor in the entire world. Canon has made a huge leap with image quality here. They've almost exactly caught up to the D810 sensor efficiency. If they could make the same sensor bigger, they would be getting the exact same image quality out of the D810. So I have high hopes for the 5D Mark IV. If they can take the same sensor efficiency and scale it to full frame, Canon will be able to match the D810's noise levels. Pretty remarkable stuff. Again, it's a theoretical rather than practical discussion at this point because you're still limited to the smaller sensor, which is gathering less total light, and therefore it's more noisy. Talking about the DxO Mark score with a couple of other cameras, uh, I mentioned this before, the 70 Mark II is better than either of these micro four thirds sensors because it's bigger. So at a given ISO, it's gathering much more light. Bigger buckets gather more rain, of course. If you factor in the sensor efficiency though, the 70 Mark II is actually behind the EM1. 70 Mark II is also behind the GH4. These micro four thirds sensors have some more efficient technology like backlit sensors. And therefore they actually gather light more efficiency, efficiently. The GH4 is actually more efficient than Sony and Nikon's current sensors. I love that little GH4. It's packing the most punch in a small, small package. If they were to make a big sensor with the same technology, it could be really great. One of the reasons I'm excited about the Samsung NX1. So let's go on and compare the 5D Mark III to the 7D Mark II. This is an image we showed yesterday. And looking at these two images processed in uh, Canon's professional photo app using the default settings. Uh, the three of us, our team here, couldn't really see much of a substantial difference. Uh, Chelsea and Justin actually liked the 7D Mark II's image better than the 5D Mark III. Now this doesn't exactly jive with the numbers I've just been showing you that show that the 7D Mark II is not uh, as high rated a sensor as the 5D Mark III. So why does it look better? Eliminating the noise reduction and sharpening that the uh, uh, Canon camera app added brings this more into clarity. The 7D Mark II on the left is clearly worse than the 5D Mark III, especially if you look up here in the deep, deep shadows, there's clearly more noise. And that kind of makes sense because while the 7D Mark II made an improvement in efficiency, that jump in efficiency wasn't enough to overcome the smaller sensor size. It's substantially smaller, Therefore, it's gathering substantially less light at any given ISO. Now let's talk about the 7D Mark II versus the A6000. The reason we said yesterday in the presentation that we felt like the 7D Mark II might have leapfrogged the other cameras was based on the software processing of the Canon software. I did give that caveat. I, I wasn't totally confident about it. I do want to wait still for Adobe Camera Raw to be released. So here's the image that we showed yesterday both at ISO 1600, to everyone who saw it, the 7D Mark II looked far better than the Alpha 6000. I, when I was preparing the slides, I didn't totally believe it, so I went out looking for some third party to validate or invalidate my feelings, and I, ha I found DP Review's comparison of these two cameras. This is the same ISO, both using raw images just like me, and if you look closely here, you can see the 7D Mark II looks better than the Alpha 6000. So to me, I'd found some validation. But I would argue that we were both wrong in our assessment. The 7D Mark II does not seem to be better than the Alpha 6000 for noise levels. Here's another image with everything turned off in both Lightroom, which processed the Alpha 6000 image, and Canon software. So I have the sharpening unsharp mask, and noise reduction all at zero, trying to get down to the base image coming off the sensor as much as possible. And looking at these two images, I definitely prefer the Alpha 6000 better. 
There's a lot of color noise in the Canon image, especially if you look again up into this corner here. Um, they're not too far off. It's kind of splitting hairs at this point. But I do think the Alpha 6000 actually looks a bit better. But again, we're using different software. So it would be like creating a key lime pie using two different recipes and then saying you like key lime pie or don't. Anyway, the different software could make different processing choices. So we're going to have to wait for Adobe Camera Raw to be updated for the 7D Mark II to be confident about it. But here's the comparison from DxO Mark showing the 7D Mark II in orange and the Alpha 6000 in red. The original 7D is shown in yellow. So you can see that even according to their scores, the 7D Mark II has virtually closed the gap. It's now very, very close to the performance that we're getting from the Alpha 6000, which is basically the top rated uh, APS-C sensor in the world. I'd also like to point out that the Alpha 6000, while they're both APS-C, it's a bigger sensor. Nikon and Sony have a 1.5x crop factor, while Canon has a 1.6x crop factor. Canon sensors, they're both called APS-C, but they're a little bit smaller, and that little bit of difference matters. So if you look at the DxO Mark scores, the 7D Mark II is about 24% behind the Alpha 6000. But if you factor in that size difference, if you look at sensor efficiency, it's only 9% behind. So the Alpha 6000 still, it's better, uh, but it's really very, very close. And it's really significant that Canon has almost caught up with Nikon and Sony. I think they're back in the game. It's kind of a big deal. And I want to emphasize one really important point here. Image quality is not everything. It's just the easiest thing to test. People love numbers. They love things like megapixels and scores. Because we can just look at it and know instantly which is better. But that's not really the way photography works. We loved the 7D Mark II, not just because of the image quality improvements. The image quality is good, but because we loved the focusing system, which is fantastic. The handling on it is wonderful. The new buttons and dials allow you to quickly shift focusing points and get your subject into focus. The back button works much better than it did in the original 7D. Also, the Canon lens infrastructure for sports and wildlife is outstanding. That 400 millimeter f5.6 lens is lightweight and absolutely wonderful. It beats every single similarly priced zoom lens out there. Nikon, Sony, they just don't have it. You can't get one for Olympus or Panasonic. Anyway, it's a great, th there's many, many factors that go into photography besides image quality. And for that matter, there's a lot that goes into it besides just gear, right? You have lighting. If you're taking portraits, it's not about your sensor. It's much more about the expression that you pull out of your model, the light that you put on her. Uh, if you are interested in actual photographic technique and not just gear, shoot with what you have and study photography a little bit. My book, Stunning Digital Photography, can help you do that. Look it up at our website at SDB Community or just go to Amazon. You can get it just about anywhere. We missed some questions in yesterday's live show because we simply had too many. So I'd like to take a minute and go over some of those questions now. First up, how does the low light on the 70 Mark II compare to that as, as uh, of the D7100? And the answer is they're much closer <laughs> than the 7D, the original 7D was to the D7100. Uh, Canon is still not quite there with the sensor efficiency, but they're now very, very close. And I would argue that the image quality doesn't necessarily need to sway you one way or the other. If you're looking for a sports and wildlife camera, I wholeheartedly recommend the 70 Mark II over the D7100 for other reasons that I was talking about besides the image quality. Things like the buffer can just take more shots uh, before it runs out of buffer. It can, has a higher frame rate, frames per second, and the lens selection is just far, far better for sports and wildlife. Uh, Damien Conway, is it really worth the price tag? I don't know because I don't know how rich you are. I don't know what you're doing or what kind of photography you're taking. Uh, I, I was telling this story the other day, but if you're a landscape photographer, and you want to get great pictures, would you be better off with a beautiful D810 at the park down the street? Or would you be better off with a T3i, a cheapo camera, and a trip to Yosemite? You know, it, is it worth the price tag? I, I have no idea. It really depends on whether you're a professional or not. But for most people, upgrade, they, most people upgrade the bodies way too soon. You're better off putting your money into, well, education first, but also things like lighting or travel. Blue Paw 89, being the high frames per second, what is the buffer de depth 
33 frames before the buffer runs out, though that can be more if you have a really fast CF card. So I haven't gone through and tested different models of CF cards yet, but generally a faster CF card will allow the buffer to unload some pictures before it completely fills up. Uh, the buffer concerns are also only when shooting raw, which is something I generally prefer to do, especially for wildlife. But if you switch to JPEG, you can shoot over 100 shots before the buffer runs out. Jerry Johnson, our friend, I think the programs have been up to the anti-noise-wise, uh, plus some new sensor design. I mentioned this because below 1600, there isn't much of a change. He, he's saying, yes, I think the difference here is in software. And yesterday, I didn't think that was the case because we were using raw files. But now I realize that Canon was applying different amounts of noise reduction to different camera models, which surprised me. Uh, we took that out, and indeed, the differences are less than we expected, but the improvement is still really, really significant. Nil Stika. Hey guys, I shoot something like 50% family shots, 40% birds, 10% landscapes. I currently use the Canon 50D. Is a 7D Mark II better for this use, or maybe the 70D? Well, for those 40% of birds, it's going to be way better than the 50D, which has comparably a very antiquated focusing system. The 7D Mark II will also have better image quality. Um, for the landscapes, you'll definitely see better image quality. Uh, and as well as for the family shots, you know, depending on, yeah, so yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's good, especially for the birds. For the, the other things that might push you to like a comparably priced, comparably priced full frame camera, like uh, D610 maybe, uh, but the D610 wouldn't be a good choice for photographing birds. Another question from Jerry. Tony, even in RAW, when you use uh, digital photo professional for, are you actually seeing cleaner, sharper images that could also be firmware programming? Yeah, we kind of confirmed that a lot of that came from the software itself. We've eliminated in this round of testing, though, so you get to see more true comparisons between them. Which camera do the ducks prefer, the 7D Mark II or the 5D Mark III? Uh, that's rolling back to the... Uh, comparisons that we had yesterday, and the docs preferred the 70 Mark II hands down. Ditto Glenn, doesn't buffer seconds vary depending on the speed of the memory card? Yeah, we discussed that. Uh, Jan Eric Edvertson, Tony, why you wear such big white laces on your hoodie? Such distraction, much bright. So Tony, so wow. Um, because I'm part of the cool younger generation, and Jan, I guess you're just not hip like me. Razer 2048, how far can the highlights be recovered compared to other cameras? Uh, the answer is not as much as Nikon and Sony cameras. The dynamic range doesn't seem to have changed. I did test that with the RAW files, and I really didn't see any improvement there. That's an area I would definitely like to see Canon improve. Um, but again, it's not going to impact you unless you've misexposed the picture or the scene is too contrasty. It's important, it just doesn't appear in every picture like the ISO rating does. Chris Henry, for wildlife, the 72 has got to be the best choice, right? Um, yes, I think if some, somebody's shooting wildlife, I'm going to push them towards the 7D Mark II for almost every scenario. I might even encourage shifting from the 5D Mark III to the 7D Mark II. The only exception would be if you are able to fill the frame on your full frame camera. The 5D Mark III, when you apply 1.6x crop, is only 8 megapixels compared to 20 megapixels in the 7D Mark II. So you get far more detail when you have to crop. But in wildlife, being realistic, you pretty much always have to crop. I have managed to fill the frame with birds and a full frame camera like the 5D Mark III. But I was using a 500 millimeter lens, a $10,000 lens with a teleconverter. I was hiding in a tent and using bird calls to bring the birds closer to me. It, it's quite a production to fill the frame with a bird on a full frame camera. If you're shooting bigger game like moose or deer, uh, or if you're at a safari or something where you can really get close to the animals, you still might be able to fill the frame with a full frame camera. But most wildlife people are doing birds because they're plentiful and brightly colored. And the 70 Mark II, I think, is by far the best choice. And that's what's going to be in the new free update to my photography buying guide. Boss 302, how does this compare image quality a lot wise to the Fuji X-T1? I have no good way to assess that um, because Fuji has a novel sensor with a different filter on it and DxO Mark has never tested a Fuji camera. Now we do have an X-T1 um, and it seems to have good image quality, but people also don't trust Adobe's processing of those RAW files. So most people who shoot 
Fujis generally shoot JPEGs and they're happy with it. But you wouldn't use them for the same type of photography generally anyway. 7D Mark II is a great action camera. The Fuji is just not a great action camera, not just because of the uh, more limited focusing system, but because of the limited lens selection. How does it compare to the OMDs and the A6000? I think we addressed that today. Uh, it's very close to the A6000. It's better than the OMDs, Micro Four Thirds cameras, though they actually have a more efficient sensor. They're doing more with less light. Miss Koska, how does the 70 Mark II feel for someone with tiny hands? Does it feel really heavy and bulky? Uh, the answer is probably going to be yes, because it's about the same size as the 5D Mark III. It's bigger than the original 7D, or at least it feels a little bit bigger. But I don't know. Chelsea is a woman. I guess she's got, she's a piano player and she's got fairly good sized hands, but I, I don't know. <laughs> it's not a small camera. You'd probably be happy with a mirrorless camera if that's a big concern. Dennis Lee, thought you might answer uh, above ISO 6400 for shooting basketball in poorly lit gyms. Would you expect unusable results at high ISOs with the 7D Mark II? That's a very subjective question because um, what's usable and unusable for people is going to be different. I will say that I get, this is probably the most common question I get from new photographers is, why do my kids' sports games look so terrible? And it's always the indoor sports, right? I, the lighting is always so bad in gyms. You're shooting at either ISO 3200, if you have a fast lens, like an F2.8 lens, or more likely ISO 6400 or even 12800, if you have like a kit lens. And your images are going to be really noisy. So the 7D Mark II does better than the 7D. Quarter stop to a third of a stop better. It's substantially better. It's basically state of the art for APS-C cameras now. But a full frame camera is always going to do better. I think the ultimate camera, if you could get close enough, would be the Nikon D810. The image quality is excellent. The sharpness on it is wonderful. And the focusing system is absolutely fantastic. It might also push you to a D750, another full frame Nikon camera that has the same focusing system. But I would only recommend those if you can get close enough that you don't have to crop your images. If you do have to crop, then I would push you towards the 7D Mark II. So kind of depends on the lens that you end up getting for it too, and the sport that you're doing. But usually, if it's your kid's games and it's basketball, you can be right on the sidelines. And for that, I'll, I'll usually go for a 50 millimeter f1.4 lens, just a prime lens, let you get nice and close, and you can hide out under the basket. Or if you're a little bit farther away, maybe to 70 to 200 f2.8. But for basketball, usually reach isn't a problem. Again, I'll push you to the D750 or the D810. One last plug for my photography buying guide, which you can pick up at sdpcommunity.com or at Amazon. Over 350 pages of technical detailed information like this about camera gear. If you're into camera gear, or if you're thinking about spending thousands of dollars on camera gear, it's probably worth the $9.99 to check out the ebook at least. Also, if you're interested in actual photographic techniques, check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography. It teaches you everything from portraits, weddings, landscapes, Lots of techniques for wildlife, which are far more important than the gear again, getting close, figuring out where the birds are, how not to disturb them, camouflage, night photography, HDR, everything you can possibly think of. And if you're interested in the post-processing, I have a new book on Lightroom, which is going to be released soon. Check it out at sdp.io slash LR. Share this video with your friends, get them to subscribe, and please, if you appreciate the effort we put in, give us a like. If you have any follow-up questions, add a comment, and I'll try to get back to you. Thanks so much.